Um, me, 42 years ago, looking into a box of archives like Pandora, it's disappeared again, <laughs> like Pandora, and like Pandora's box, archaeological archives are a bit like that, aren't they? Uh, you open them up, you think there's going to be full of hope, um, but actually all these nasty things often fly out around the outside of you um, that you weren't quite expecting, and I know that because I've listened to lots of your talks about it today. Um, and yesterday. So, uh, yeah, I like to think of archaeological archives a bit like that. I never know what I'm going to find. Um, and I try to get that across to people, and it doesn't matter what I'm going to find, it's actually what other people might find and what other me m people might take from this box. Um, I'm not going to talk about a particular project. Uh, I'm going to talk about something which. Is it actually going to move? Is it moving? Not moving. See? So this is the shameless plug for a book that is coming out next week. Um, obviously, it waited until after the period of mourning, so we'll be able to tell people about it on the 22nd of September. Um, this is a book that's been about four or five years in the making. Uh, Alice Stevenson first talked to me after another uh, conference at UCL about archaeological archives, and she said, you can write a chapter for my book, and you can, you can choose what title you want for it. And I stupidly said, Oh yeah, I'll write something about unlocking the potential of archaeological archives, and then I realised that I'd given myself quite a big task. I am not intending to go through this chapter. If anybody wants a copy of the chapter, just speak to me because I can send you a copy pre-publication, uh, unedited, obviously. Um, but the thing about this is, there's 28 chapters. It's not all about archaeological archives. It's not a manual of how you run a museum. Um, it poses lots of questions. Uh, it discusses some of the subjects such as restitution, decolonization, and, and other considerations. So um, I would um, recommend it. So just for clarity, I know that you all know an archaeological archive it relates to a project. And it's a project that usually produces material, three-dimensional finds, and documents. And that that document could be digital, um, at, it could be paperwork, uh, it could be a graphic. Um, and the whole purpose of that is to make it useful for some other purpose in the future, ideally, archaeologically, um, but it is for future generations. Um, it's a, we all talk about that once-in-a-lifetime experiment. When we dig something up, you can't re-dig it. So, uh, obviously, this is the standard and guidance. In terms of the, the book itself, the chapter that I wrote addressed all of these things. Um, and so uh, you'll find lots of facts and figures in there about these themes. I'm not going to talk about any of those today. I'm going to come up with a 12-point provocation to you to think about what you need to think about in terms of unlocking the potential of archaeological archives. Um, I only put that picture in there just to remind myself what my store used to look like um, before it got really tatty and too many things uh, stored in it. So, who for? If you follow Twitter, you'll know that there is a very famous meme, how it was and how it's going. Um, so I took my lead from a quote from um, the Merriman Swain article just here that was written in 1999 um, about how people have this very narrow view of what archaeological archives are about. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see a publication that we brought out in 2021 during lockdown, SMA, 14 case studies that just proves that it's not just about that stuff on the left-hand side. It's about all of these things as well. Um, so I like people to think about it's, it's for the widest community, it's for the widest public, it's not just for archaeologists, it's not just for people like you and me, and we need to engage as many people as we possibly can with this as a resource, because that's what we hold. We hold the resource, and as museum archaeologists, we are the facilitators of people accessing that resource. If this resource is not accessible, we might well not have it. Um, and it's for everybody, it's not just for archaeologists. So therefore, number one, recognise it is not just about the archaeology. And when I say that, um, we have a very particular viewpoint. But this, this is an event, this is our Festival of Archaeology event, that was the first one that took place after the pandemic. 
Bristol Spilling Archaeology, we've got 22 or 24 different organisations that engage with archaeology. Um, it looks like a nice, happy festival. It was. We had about 2,700 people in the afternoon that came and did lovely things. We had people who were reenactors. All of their material is based on archaeological archive that's been dug up out of the ground. It's not immediately obvious it's about archaeological archives, but it is. For them, they put their efforts into the reenactment, the visualization of it in three dimensions. Uh, we've got Cotswold Archaeology there. They dig it up, they produce archives. So I can absolutely categorically say that everything that's happening on that field all comes back to what's been dug up out of the ground. It's just not immediately obvious. And it's not straight archaeology in the sense that we're not going, and this is a site that has 22 pit, pits that's, you know, got 500 bits of bangle in it or things like that. It's, this is what we think life is like. This is our interpretation of it. This is how we want young children to come start engaging with us. Um, and if that means that we are drawing designs on plates or testing some food stuff or making clay, well, making clay pots, which is obviously archaeological, then that's what we're doing. Um, I don't believe that my job is just about revealing the archaeological record as archaeology. It's about facilitating access to it and then enabling people to be inspired by it the way they want to be inspired by it. So if they want to be artists or if they want to write books or whatever, it's not just about the archaeology. Think in the wider sense. You have to understand your audience. So you have to do some kind of audience focus things. So anybody who is audience focused believes that what they do is for the good. Um, and, and it makes us live a better life. I've got a card on my desk which is about I am here to enrich other people's lives. That's what my job is about. It took me a long time to understand that working in a museum was not I used to worry that all those people that were going to work in the hospital as nurses and doctors were having a much better kind of like effect on society than I did. And then actually I realised that that enrichment that we do, the material that we do, is the single most important thing that I can contribute to society. So if you have that kind of passion, and I know you all have that passion as museum archaeologists, this is what you need to do. So become audience focused. You need to know about your audience. You need to be doing it on their behalf. And in order to do that, you've got to evaluate. These are really boring graphs, but actually, these graphs tell me what about our engagement was with the Archaeology Online series that we did, and we are continuing to do on behalf of three local societies. It tells me what I need to know. We had about 2,500 people that attended lectures over the last year online. Um, we know where they come from, we know whether they're enjoying the, the lectures, we know what their level of satisfaction is. We've got qualitative data as well. And it's not just about knowing who you are reaching, because it's about who you're not reaching. It's who you're not reaching the important to your audience because you want to work out how you're going to get to them um, and then also doing different things and coming back to something that Angie said and about that um, the kind of like the accessibility of it we know that the, a lot of these people um, have some form of disability because they're telling us about that much higher proportion engagement with those people who have never done anything with the museum before they have probably never even been into the museum before and we know that because we've got and those qualitative comments that come through evaluation are the ones which help you get your funding to do the jobs that you need to do in museums because they advocate on your behalf. So the more you know about your audience, the more you can get them to advocate for what you do and the more you're able to do it for them. So be mindful of significance and how it, work, how it varies. So in the rationalisation guidance that we put together, we talked about significance. Because obviously there is significance archaeologically, but there can be significance from an individual's perspective or from a community's perspective. And that varies, and it can vary before a dig, because you might have some uh, idea of what it might be that you're going to discover. It will change when you don't actually find what you thought you were digging. Um, and then it will change again post-excavation, once it's all been written up, and then potentially again once uh, somebody's done some research on it. Um, you might have, this is a Roman villa site that was dug locally. Um, you might only have one villa site 30 years ago, and now you've got 40 villa sites, so suddenly that one villa site is less significant potentially than the rest. This was deemed to be not so significant in terms of the archaeological record where we were. Uh, the local community 
Committee, I should explain that Lockmeads is a big post-war housing development council um, based um, just in the centre of Bristol. Um, for them, they described it as the most important archaeological discovery in the area. That's because there hadn't been any other archaeological discovery in the area. This was really at the centre of their community. They had been promised community engagement with it. They didn't know it was going to be built anywhere. It was, this is a housing statement. And to them, this was the single most important thing that had happened to them. For the archaeological record, it was another villa site to the rest of us. The significance varies, and it varies by perspective. Um, if you want to read more about it, obviously, Cotswold uh, did the excavation. When I looked at that again the other day, I realised, actually, this is not just any other villa site. This is the Dings villa site, and there are some really quite significant things that are different about it compared to our local villas. So, significance varies from, from different perspectives. Um, some people have talked about telling stories. Um, I would like everybody to agree to become a teller of multiple stories and not just to think about the stories that you want to tell, to think about the stories that other people would like to hear. Um, Jenny Butterworth will recognise this poster. It was a, a, an exhibition that we did with Stoke and Trent Museum. Um, it was 100 and odd uh, pieces of the Staffordshire Board. Number one, nobody in Bristol has heard of the Staffordshire Board. When you ask them that question, don't assume that everybody knows that story because they don't. Um, and you'll see that um, the, the latest uh, Lord of the Rings poster is remarkably like cameras where they're holding a sword. We were riffing off um, uh, Game of Thrones at the time and we were talking about this, the unknown the, 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 uh, and the known and the twilight distance between the two. And the multiple stories, this was, this was an exhibition about swords and the fittings that went on swords and the craftsmanship that went into that. Um, what was the story that Alvis just wanted to hear the most? Who found it? When did he find it? What was it worth? Why haven't you told us that story? So everything that came back in terms of the feedback, great exhibition, but we want to know about Terry. We want to know about how we dug it up. So we had to add that into the exhibition in a different form because that's the story they wanted to hear rather than the one we were telling. Um, and then the other thing is how you tell these stories. So we tell stories and we write an interpretive narrative uh, structure. Uh, we're all very limited. I was joking the other night about building my own heritage centre where I could use words with more than three syllables in because nobody's going to stop me if it was mine. In this one, we write really dry text quite a lot of the time because we have to reduce it. We take out some of the romance. We take out some of that creativity. Um, I wrote a poem about all of those things that we don't know. It was one of the most, most things that people responded to in the entire exhibition because it puts some of that creative, um, mythical quality back into the exhibition that didn't exist in the ordinary labels. So if you're going to tell stories, tell them in different ways. Don't just tell them in, in, in the way that you think you've been taught museologically to do so. Make no assumptions about quality. We had a comment the other day about CBM and getting rid of CBM. How are you, Ben? And I said, never underestimate the quality of any kind of collection. Um, this is a comment from the chapter, and, and it takes its lead from uh, Duncan's description about what archaeological archives are for in the standards that were produced in 2007. Um, and also the work that we did on the rationalisation project um, which Museum of London very nicely showed us in their scoping study uh, was that things that you thought were useless weren't actually useless in terms of the archaeological record. You could make no assumptions. And you couldn't make assumptions that things that have been dug up relatively recently were going to tell you more things than the things that have been dug up in the past. And this is an example of something that happened relatively recently in Bristol. So these are two boxes of an archive is it an archive? It's a collection of finds in bags with labels. That's all I had. I had no documentary paperwork. Somebody asked me a question, did I have any material from this site called Burlidge Camp in Somerset that had been dug up in 1955? Um, and they thought it, had been thought it had come in as part of a much larger collection. And I knew all the names that had come in as part of that archive. And the answer was no. Went rooting around and found these two boxes. And it was only in discussion with the... Um, with the person who was asking the question, that I realised actually, erroneously, it had been published as part of another archive 
And all of those numbers and all of those bags match all of these pick sections that are in this publication. And that the, the pots that are in those bags that come from these test pits are now being looked at by a, a, a pot specialist. Um, and they have confirmed what the researcher thinks, which is this is a transitional site between the later Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. And those boxes have been in our store since 1955 with no paperwork attached to them. But they're now revealing a story that we didn't know um, that we even had in our collection. You know, you might assume that it was worthless because there was no documentary record. It wasn't. So don't make assumptions. Maximize your relationships with other disciplines. This is Amber Turner. Um, you can see we've got some archaeological fragments of Delft wedges there. They are replica um, Delft things. This is one of the stalls that was at the Festival of Archaeology. Amber is uh, our curator of applied art in Bristol Museum. And she started working at Bristol Museum on a two-year funded project funded by the Art Fund to look at our Delftware collection. So obviously Bristol is a big Delftware producing uh, city. We've got something like 2,100 complete Delftware pots in the applied art collection. I've probably got about 50,000 bits of Delftware that have been dug up from various sites. Uh, most people will see this kind of thing on display. They won't see this on display. Um, the way that Amber thinks about that Delftware collection is completely different to us from an archaeological perspective. So this is a project to foreground and to research Bristol's Delftware collection. And as part of that, Naomi's already talked to you this morning about some of the, the work that's going to go, go on in terms of analysing the mineral content of each, each one of these fragments uh, to try and figure out whether we can tell if it was actually made in Bristol or not. Um, so cultivate your relationships with other disciplines doesn't mean just museum disciplines that are in your museum. Um, it could be any one of the other 49 subject specialist networks that are part of the subject specialist network consortium, which could mean you might be talking to the photography network because every single one of us has a collection of historic photographs. And, and they're not just relevant to the archaeological collection, they are relevant to other people. So SSN Consortium has got its own website. The product of this um, uh, project that Amber is doing will result in a redisplay of the Delftware collection in Bristol Museum for the first time since 1987, and it will incorporate some of my broken pieces alongside the very lovely not broken pieces uh, to demonstrate where they were made and how they were made. Meet multiple agendas. Uh, this is Kate Hiles on the right hand side. Uh, she's talking to a group of people in a very nice landscape. What you need to know is this is Blaise Castle. And Blaise Castle is a kind of folly that sits on the top of a hill. It sits in the middle of an Iron Age hill fort in a Humphrey Repton re landscaped park at the side of one of our museums. And uh, everything that Kate is telling this group, which was a walk into wellness group that was set up post pandemic, is all based on archaeological archive evidence. So it's everything that we've got about any excavation that's taken place on top of the hill. So we know about um, the, the Iron Age hill fort. We also suspect there is a Roman temple site just there and maybe a medieval chapel. All of what Kate is telling these people as part of a wellness walk is all based on our archaeological archive. It's just not immediately obvious. She's synthesized that information. She's made it in a public way. We now have regular walks that are programmed to use the archaeological landscape based on what she's doing. So the meeting the multiple genders matters because obviously we can demonstrate impact. We can demonstrate impact on people and their lives that aren't just archaeological, which takes me back to it's not just about the archaeology. Um, become an active initiator of research. That means don't wait for other people to come and ask you to research your collections. If there are things that you want to be researched, my top of my list at the moment now is all of those objects that have dodgy patterns that are in that collection <laughs> that Emma, Emma talked about this morning. Um, because that came out, that was a serendipitous uh, thing that happened. But you need to be proactive. You need to put that information out there, A, about what you've got, and B, what you want researching or could be researched, rather than waiting for people to come to you. And we do actually say in the standards, this is what, exactly what we say about a research charter. You put a research charter out there, it helps students like Naomi and others to know what is available, what are your timescales, what are the places that you've got that you can provide for people to work in. Um, 
what, what would you need from those people in terms of the research that they ought to do about your collection before they even get there? So take control of that and, and also write your own research objectives and publish them. Um, and obviously, try and garner all of that information that other people has or, have already been taking from your collection um, and publishing, but not necessarily giving it back to you. So become initiators of research rather than uh, facilitators of other people. Stop creating inadvertent barriers to access. I already talked about uh, archives that are inaccessible might as well not exist. Again, how it is or how it should be going. We've talked about online journeys, online databases, collections databases. In reality, what we do is actually create barriers to access to information by tarting everything up so that you have a wonderful journey online to find things. When in reality is, a lot of people are more than happy with an Excel spreadsheet that has all of the data in it that they can download and they can sort, they can reimagine, they can repurpose and reuse. And that's been really democratic with the information. You know, when we put five bits of information in collections online, it really looks really whizzy on the front page of a museum's uh, collection search page. But actually, it's really frustrating. And it probably ends up creating more work for you and more work for the researchers if you cannot find ways of doing this. So one of the things that I would suggest is that everybody explores open data. And in order to be able to do that, you might have an open data platform where you can do this, or you need to partner more with people like ADS. Now, it's the devil's own job finding this page on ADS, so that's another conversation that we need to have with ADS about how to find museum pages. But Museums Worcestershire have a page, um, and that page leads them to all of the data sets that are loaded up about archaeological archives that are pertinent to their collections. This is the one, one holding place, the library that people should be going to to get information. So, it, you know, it's incumbent upon us to supply that library with this data and to give people a front door to get it into. And it's free to do this. So, contact ADS and start creating these web pages. And then, I always think about objects on display as the clickbait. The clickbait to get people interested in archaeological archives. They're the three-dimensional things that people, people relate to. The really difficult thing that people uh, don't really see is all that documentary stuff because you have, to, you have to morph it into something else which is more palatable. And I know we don't all have loads of money to be able to do this kind of thing, but this is one of the best things that I've ever seen, which is the Reykjavik Settlement Exhibition in Iceland. If you've got loads of money, go to Iceland to see it. Um, but essentially, it is a site museum and what they do is have a touch screen and they've incorporated photographs from the archaeological archive to demonstrate what the evidence is that has actually resulted in this display. So you see the connection between what we as archaeologists see and what we're putting on display in a museum as an interpretation. And it makes that direct connection. And we don't do enough of that with paper or documentary archive. And then number 12. I've been banging on about this for a long time. We need to rehumanize the record. So, in our attempts to um, standardize what we're doing, we've actually been writing ourselves out of the record. Um, it's really difficult to get people interested in what happens on a site if you can't actually show people doing things on a site because you standardize the archive to such an extent that these people are written out of it. People like the human hands. They don't necessarily like a spreadsheet that would be put on display. I would never put a spreadsheet on display, it's so boring. But they like the documentary stuff. We have to find ways of enabling this kind of material and also new versions of it, the equivalence of it, into our displays and into how we engage with people. And then, um, just to highlight that, these two chaps appear on the left hand side. I only know that they were the two only that were paid to excavate Roman villa site out of Lawrence Weston in the 1940s because I have this whole raft of what looks like ephemeral paperwork. There's a great story in that paperwork about how the city engineer and the city architect and the museum had a massive row about who was in charge of the site. That's a fantastic story about the excavation. That is the hook. That's the hook to get people interested in all of the rest of this. And because I've got this paperwork, I now know what the names of these two men are. I know what the names of the two men in suits are. I 
didn't know what the names of the dippers were, but I do now. And finally, there is this big disconnect between what we do as museum archaeologists based in museums and what people do digging it up. It is really rare now that we have diggers that are based in museums, um, and those boxes are quite anonymous. You develop relationships with people like Nikki, who work for different kinds of units, um, but actually, we have a skill set which is about engaging people. Uh, we have a skill set to talk to other people. We know all these people, we network. So I feel that it's incumbent upon us to use our skill sets on the sites. And we need to reacquaint ourselves with the people that dig it and make a relationship with them. So that's my 12 kind of like provocations for you in terms of unlocking the potential of archaeological archives. Thank you.